All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin our lecture. And the focus of what we're about to do today is regression. So you remember we considered a situation where you have <clears throat> a paper that you are going to write. And this paper is entitled The Determinants of Demand you know, um, in the Alcoholic Beverage Industry in Ghana, the Impact of Location, Occupation, and Religion. We indicated the other time that this is a possible structure of the paper or the thesis your abstract, your introduction, your literature, your methodology, results, discussion and conclusions. You have collected the data already and want to establish causality, okay? You want to do real regression. The purpose of regression is to establish causality and to do prediction. This one, we want to establish causality first and look at the impact or the influence of the independent variables on the dependent variables. But it would be nice to know what our variables were. <clears throat> and we have a data set that we have been using all along. The data set is the Brukutu Ventures data set. So very soon I'll be showing you the data set, but there are some few things you want to know when you are undertaking such kind of regression. First thing is that you want to understand that before you undertake the regression, you have generated and interpreted the descriptive statistics of the data. So the data may have the quantity demanded, the price, the complement price, the income, the location, the occupation, and then the religion. You want to generate a descriptive statistics, including all the measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion, all the descriptive statistics that one is supposed to know about, the coefficient of variation, the ketosis, the skewness, all of them. So that is something that you want to familiarize yourself with. The second thing is you want to under know how to undertake a univariate analysis. All of this we looked at before. What I'm just doing is a recapitulation. So you want to check the distribution of some of the variables, let's say of the quantity demanded, what is the distribution? Is it normally distributed? Is it positively skewed? Is it negatively skewed? Is it bimodal, binomial, exponential, normal, okay, or log normal? Okay. Do some of the variables require log transformation and why? For example, do we need to take the log of price or we should just leave price as it is. And I'm talking about this is when you're undertaking real research, you know, or real application or real project. And you gotta justify why you are, um, you know, taking the log of some variables, taking the square of some variables and taking, you know, interacting some variables, moderating some variables and then, you know, all of that. So you need to know how to undertake the, univariate analysis. Then you need to know how to do the bivariate analysis, which we did the last time. And that include correlations. You wanna learn how to do correlation or generating heat map in R. How to generate scatter plot matrix together with the p-value. Okay, so that means you have the significant correlation. The one that will have the correlations at the top and then the p-values at the bottom. You need to be able to generate and detect that a particular correlation is significant or insignificant. So after you've done all of these exploratory data analysis, that is when you come to do the real regression, okay? So we are about to take this and do the actual regression now. And I'm gonna show you the data and then I'll take it to R. So remember, we are still using this data set. <clears throat> this data set is known as the Brook to Venture data set. This is a data set you have been working with, okay? And in this data set, the quantity demanded is 
the quantity demanded of gene betas is the dependent variable, okay, which is influenced supposedly by price of the gene betas, the complement price of gene betas, the income of the people, the location of the shop, the occupation, and the religion of the people. Now, these last three elements are categorical variables from which we can create dummies. <clears throat> now, in a simple regression, the dummies will be created for you. Okay, so uh, there isn't that much problem with that. So how do you proceed? How do you undertake um, a regression? How do you go around a regression? How do you proceed? How do you handle it? That is the job of today's exercise. So I'm taking us to R and then we see. But first, copy the data, control A to copy, control A to highlight, control C to copy the data. Then open your R studio and you have your command. I'm going to use the first command here, command number 69. And I'm naming the name of the data as gene. So I'm going to run this gene. Look at the bottom of the, of the console down here. And you will notice that it's been loaded. Okay, It's been written as blue, which means that it's been loaded. So the data is loaded. In order to see the data, just highlight the gene and run it. Only the gene I can. <clears throat> look at the beauty look at the beauty down here so the same data that was in excel is now imported into the memory of r you still have the quantity demanded the price the complement price the income of the people the location of the shop the occupation of the people and the religion of the people all right now <clears throat> We want to attach the data into the memory of R. And that requires that we do this attach. But remember to detach, okay? Now, why are we doing attach? We do this attach so that we will not have to apply the dollar symbol anytime we are commanding R to pick a variable from the data set. So in this case, once you write a variable kill, you don't need to write it as, you know, gen dollar kill which actually indicates that you are picking the kill from the data set. So we want to do attach, okay? But don't forget to detach when you're finished. Because I have done the attach already, I'm gonna go ahead and plot the data using the command here. Okay, so I want you to look at the command carefully because I'm gonna first explain the command before you know, anything else. So this is a command. The command says plot the quantity demanded, which depends on only price. There's a simple regression we're running. Only price. Okay. And when you are plotting, the scatter plot of the data should be blue. The line width should be two. You can increase the line width to be thicker by increasing it to three or four. The name of the data is Jane and give it a title. The title is the main here, okay? And the title of the data should be scatter plot of Q and P with fitted line. Fitted line is the line of best fit. And this command actually generates the fitted line. Once you bring the semicolon, ab line, okay? Ab line will give you the fitted line. This ab line, and then the name of the data as gen simple line weight is four here and the color is red. Now. I must say that this gene simple is a simple regression of the data. If you have not run this gene simple first, it will not work. So you want to run the gene simple first. Okay. That is right here in command number 74. So you run the gene simple first. If you add the summary gene simple, it will show the results as well. Okay. And when you run that before you show the scatter plot, okay, because it's assumed that you have run it. Let me just run it for you to see the result. Look at the results down here. That's a gene simple. And you can see that the only variable is price. All other independent variables are excluded. It has other elements. We'll talk about them in the course of time. Okay. Once you have run this gene simple, go back and then run your plot. And the reason why mine worked is because I've done it already ahead. And so it automatically works. But if you are running this plot and it's, it's not working, 
Okay, the up line, that is the affected line is not showing. Then it simply means you have to run a gene sample first. So, so look at the scatter plot now. Just look at the scatter plot. Look at it with all you know, your eyes. And you will notice that indeed there is a relationship between the price okay, and the quantity demanded. Okay. I'm sure you can see it. this price and this quantity demanded, they have a relationship. It appears, if you look at it carefully, that the, the relationship is negative, which means that as the price increases here, okay, sorry, as the price increases towards the right, the quantity demanded is falling. As the price is increasing, the quantity demanded is falling. So the law of demand is applicable, appears to be applicable here. Okay. So that is a simple regression. What makes it simple? Because we are dealing with just one independent variable. One independent variable, okay? And we have plotted it, but we've also generated the regression summary, as you can see here. Now, for you to know that this is true, look at the actual numbers. And we will represent the estimate by the relationship. So we'll let come and explain all this. The estimate will tell you the relationship between the price and then the quantity demanded, between the price and then the quantity demanded here. And the relationship says that, okay, if you look here, the relationship is negative, which is exactly what we detected here in the graph. We saw that as a negative relationship. The number negative is telling us exactly the fact that it was negative. The only thing is that the graph was not telling us by how much. The graph was not exactly indicating the equation of the line. It was not telling us by how much. The data result here is telling us that by how much is by 14.26 units. What does that mean? Because price is a changing variable, it will mean that and of course, because there are no other variable around, they would, we can't say they're holding all other factors constant because there are no other factors. So what it means is that a one unit increase in the price okay, reduces, why reduces? Because of the symbol negative. A one unit increase, a one unit, and there is a reason why I'm using the word unit. Unit because you don't want to, Use words like dollar, yen, CDs, you know, kilograms and all of that to confuse yourself. So you keep the unit of measurement standardized and say unit. So a one unit increase okay, in the price of Jane reduces the quantity demanded of Jane by 14.26. Two six units, okay, 14.26 units. That is the interpretation, okay? And you are interpreting a numerical variable, which is price. <clears throat> so the way you interpret it is very, very important, okay? As to whether this increase is significant or is not significant is determined by the p-values here. But I will not go into more details until we get to the uh, multiple regression, okay? So for now, in simple terms, price is doing some great work in affecting negatively the quantity demanded. So if you actually increase your price of a good and I'm not buying it, and this data is showing why I'm not buying it because the price is too much. And I see the good as a you know, um, normal good. All right, after you've generated this information, there are some few things you want to note. And one of them is you want to be able to find some few things like the fitted line. Okay, so in regression, there is something we call the fitted line. The fitted line is what we drew here, but we were able to draw that fitted line because of using some numbers. Now, remember some few things about regression. Regression is something like this simple regression, by the way. Okay, you have y equals to beta naught plus beta one x, 
okay, plus zero. Okay. Now, one of the assumptions of regression is that the expected value of this error is zero. Okay, so the expectation of the error is zero. Okay. That is when you have estimated the model. By the time you estimate the model, you get something like this. Okay. Y cap equal to beta naught cap and then beta one cap and then X. Now, what, what, what did this mean? What did this mean? Now, because the expected value of the error term is zero, that is why you can see that the last part, I did not bring the error term. What we are seeing here is something interesting because actually from there, from this original equation, I took, I can take all the information on the right-hand side to the left, you know, ignoring just the error term, leaving the error term. So I move all of this to this side. If I move all of this to this side, now all of this, that is the, the actual, that is a predicted value, okay? That is a fitted, that is a predicted value. So there's something you wanna know, and that is this. The predicted value is also the y hat, which is this one here, okay? So this y cap is this, the predicted. And so in reality, the error here is indicating the actual value minus the predicted value, which is the, the fitted line or the y hat. So there is an actual y, which is the one you have in the data. If you talk about quantity, in fact, what we are doing here is quantity. Okay. So it is actually, let me just write this in the top so that you can see. So it's quantity here, which is the beta naught plus the beta one x plus zero. See, now if we get the predicted value of K, we put a hat on it. It becomes affected as well. That predicted value is when you know the actual values of these betas, okay? And to indicate that we know the actual values, we put a cap on them. All right. So what, do, what, what, what does this mean? This, this Q is actually the fitted line or the predicted Y, but there is an actual one. There is an actual before you get what the predicted. There's an actual. So the gap between this actual and that of the predicted is the error. Okay. So what we are about to do is to find one, the actual. As for the actual, we know it. We know it from the Excel data set. Okay. We scroll up here right now, you see that. But what is that predicted? That's what we're about to find. And you find that predicted by running this fitted gene sample. Once you run that, watch it here. Okay, you see some beautiful things happen. And, then, and I mean, this is beautiful. You don't see it is beautiful, I see it is beautiful. Do you remember that when you look at the Y, the, the Q, the first Q value was 160, if you can remember. But if you don't remember, I'll take you back to see. Let's go and see in the Excel. I hope you can see it in the Excel here. This is the Q here. And the first value you can see that is what? 160. And the second value is what? 200. Now these are the actual Q. But what is their predicted? Now let's go, that's what we had. What is their predicted? So when you come here, you get the predicted values. Okay? After running this, this is the, first data and the first data point the predicted value is no longer 160 but it's rather 162 so you can see that there is a gap between the actual and the predicted and that gap that gap is what we call it as the residual or the error so the error is the actual minus the uh, predicted. So it, the actual it was what? 120, sorry, 160. 
So you have 160 minus 162.16. So if you look at this 160 minus 162.16, there is a negative, you know, 2.16. And that negative 2.16 is the residual. It is how far, it measures how far the predictor is from the actual. Okay. Now, how do you get those residuals? The next command will run that. Look at this next command, command number 77 here. When you run this command number 77, residual gen simple, it will produce those values. Let's run that. And look down here. You see, we still have now our answers. Look at that. We still have the negative one, negative 2.16 right here. Okay. And so you can see clearly the, the actual and the predicted. You can see that. And that will help you to know the residual. Where is the residual? That's number, number, sorry, that's the residual we just found. So you have the actual there, and now you have detected the residual for each observation okay, out of all observation. The beauty of this is that one of the rules of regression says the expected value, okay, let me just remind you a little bit. The expected value of this error is zero. Now, what does that mean? It simply means the mean of the error should be zero, which means on average, on average, on average, the errors must be zero. Hmm. On average, the errors must be zero. How do you get that? Well, this command will, will help you to know whether they are zero. So after you've gotten let me just clear this. After you've gotten, okay, this value that you have gotten down here, this command, okay, this command you are seeing here will run the expected value of the error term is zero. So that means the mean of the residuals, the mean of the errors, command number 78. Let's run it and see what is zero. I just run that and look down here. Oh, la, la, oh, la, la. Okay, this value is approximately zero. Because when you look at the bottom here, you have E minus 16. E minus 16 means that there are about, you know, 16 zeros, okay? Including the first zero and then the point, after the point. There are 16 zeros before the 444. There are 16 zeros before the 444. So it means that this thing is approximately what? Zero. So it's like 0 0.15 zeros, then four. Four four zero eight. We have confirmed. We have confirmed. We have confirmed that the expected value of the error term is zero. So even though some of the errors are positive and some are negative, okay, and you might be wondering which ones are negative. Look at this one here. It's, it's positive. Okay, look at this one here. It's also positive. But if you look at that, that's negative. Okay, if you look at this, that is negative. So even though eventually they will kind of, you know, zero out, and you will have that. Another thing that the, the R can give you is the confidence interval, okay? If, you, if I take you back to the regression sample, let me look at the regression sample again. If you look at the regression sample down here, okay, just look at the regression sample here. If you look at it here, this, this is it. You will notice that under this coefficient, this entire data set, there is no column for the confidence interval. Now you might be wondering what is a confidence interval. The estimate divided by the standard error should give you the T value. The T value, if when read on the normal distribution table, it will give you the P value, the probability value. Now, the probability value is used to determine the significance of each variable, each independent variable. But sometimes you would want to use a confidence interval and, and check if the estimate, the confidence interval will have a lower confidence bound and an upper confidence bound. Okay? And in between these should be the estimate. So if the estimate falls within the confidence interval, 
if this estimate, negative 14.26, is within the confidence interval, then we say that that independent variable is statistically significant. The question is, how do you get the confidence interval? Well, this little command here will give you that particular confidence interval. And you can round it to correct to two decimal places. Let's run that. So when you do this, it will give you the confidence interval for the price and then for the intercept. So you can see that the confidence interval for the price is negative 16.97 and negative 11.56. Okay. So the right one is the upper bound. The left one is the lower bound. And you can see that our negative 14.26 is actually within is within this confidence interval, which shows that price is significantly affecting the quantity demanded in this simple regression case. You can also generate an ANOVA table. Remember that a regression is a senior brother of ANOVA. You can generate an ANOVA table, which will tell you the entire you know, variation within the data, the entire variation. Okay, of the data. But the regression is expanding on that. So technically, it doesn't tell you much, but if you want to generate the ANOVA table, you can generate that. Beautiful, excellent. So that is how you do a simple regression. You need to be able to do a simple regression on each of the variables one by one. But after that, there's something else you want to know. You see, regression is a beautiful thing and you want to let the beauty of the regression actually show, get a point. If you have a regression and you are saying it's beautiful, come on, come on. If it is beautiful, let the beauty come out. Let the beauty show. Let everybody know that it is beautiful. Because if it is beautiful, we want to know that it's beautiful. And the one way we can know that it's beautiful is when you actually show some beauty around the beautiful. Okay. So how can we show some beauty around the beautiful? Well, one thing that we can do, and let me take you back here. Okay, let me take you back to the data set, our results here. Okay. Everything that we have done is here. One thing we can do is we can do some pretty nice regression. You know, the one I showed earlier was simple regression between Q and then what? And then price. Now, I want to show a, a regression of not one independent variable, but two independent variables, okay? And that is price and complement price. So I'm going to install a package in R. And the package is known as RGL and then CAR. If you have your RGL and CAR installed already, you don't need to do what I'm about to do. But what I'm about to do is just to show some beautiful things. So you install it. How do you install it? For those of you who do not know, just go to packages, click the word install, and when the pop-up comes, just type it into the install section. Okay. You should have the repository come and just type RGL, RGL. Okay. It will show if you have the internet running, and then you can click it and click install, and you are done. I have done it already, so I don't want to. Okay. And then library card, the same thing. Once you've done that, invoke them. You invoke them by running this command number 84. Once you run the command number 84, now you are ready to do a beautiful 3D plot. Now watch. You use this command, scatter 3D, and then you regress the dependent variable quantity demanded on price and complement price. You want the color to be green, so you take the color to be green, and we are using the same data set chain. Let's run that and see. Okay. All right. So the results are showing, but you can't see the results. So I'm going to change the, 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 the interface here so that you can see the result. So this is the result that I got. And these results, the beauty of the result is that you can manipulate it. Okay. You can swing it and manipulate it because what because it's a it's a three variable case. You are not showing a line. You are rather showing a surface. Okay, you are showing a surface. So you can see that there are some of the 
for example, if I squeeze it a little bit like this, you realize it's a line now. Uh -huh. Now you can see there is a line between quantity demanded and price. It's a negative relationship. I'm ignoring the complement okay, at the bottom right here. And that's why you see the line. And you can see that the green ones are positive. That's why they are green. The gap between the numbers at the top and the line is a positive number. The gap between the numbers at the bottom, the data points at the bottom and the line are negative. That is why you see that it's a little bit red. Okay. Now, so that is a line, but as you add three variable to it, the line now becomes what a surface. Okay. So now it's a surface, and you can see the beauty of this surface, you know, going there. I mean, isn't it beautiful? I don't know whether you don't see beauty, but this for me is beautiful. And it's just a way to let you know that three variable case can be drawn. Okay, but as you go beyond three variable, it becomes complex. Now you are talking about a polyhedra. Okay, which makes it a little bit difficult to even understand. But this is just to let you know that you can also generate some beautiful 3D plots, surface plot. Now, that is a plot that was moving, but we can also have another plot that is 3D, but is not moving. And how do you do that? To do that, you can install the scatterplot 3D package and run the library. Once you install and run the library, in the library, after the library, we are going to run the 3D. Watch how I call it. After indicating the name of the data, you indicate a scatterplot 3D. You have to tell R which one is the X variable. And in this case, the X variable is Q. Which one is the Y variable? And in this case, the Y variable is the price of J. Which one is the Z variable? Because there are three things you have to know. And the Z variable is C. Okay, it's C. And once you have that, you can now plot it. And I'm going to run that here. You can see on the right that it's showing very nicely, isn't it? Okay. And again, it shows a kind of a 3D. The only thing is that you can't move it like the previous one. Okay, this complement is there, the quantity is there, and the price is there. Okay, that is a nice way you can do it. Another thing you can do is that you can also decide to, you know, what do you call it? To add some color, okay? You can add some color. Let me add some blue color and see whether the whole thing. Now you can see the scatter plots are showing blue, okay? They are showing blue because I've indicated in the command, after everything I add comma, color blue. And you can see that it's showing some beautiful blue color. This is a data point. That's another way you can show. So next time you want to teach a group of people that you want to show them a beautiful two variable case. Okay. Now we started with one variable case and we dealt with that one independent variable case. And we looked at two independent variable cases. Now let's do multiple regression. Of course, we can't draw that. Huh. We can't draw that. Okay. So to do multiple regression, that one we will require more independent variables. Okay. And that's what I'm about to do now. So if you are ready for me, I'm ready to kickstart multiple regression. How do you do that? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Now, in multiple regression, we are going to load the same data. Remember, the data is already having multiple independent variables. And we are going to run this gen multi command number 91 here. Okay. I'm going to run command number 91 here. Is this command number 91 is a linear model. LM means linear model. And there's a linear model that is drawing on the relationship between quantity demanded and price, complement price, income of the people, location of the shop, occupation of the people, and religion of the people. After that, you want to summarize your data as summary gen multi. Okay. So let's run that and look down at the results. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't know what you see, but that is beauty, 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 okay? So all of these mean a lot. Everything you see here, help. we can interpret it with a lot of things, but we'll come to interpretations and talk about all the factors that make the, the data reliable, useful, you know, 
establishing causality, check whether everything has been met. We'll come back to all of that. But before that, let's look at some few things that I will want you to know. Okay, one of the first things that you would want to know has to do with the confidence interval. Because once again, you can see that the confidence interval are not showing. So you can generate the confidence interval using the command round conf int and then gen multi. Remember that simple regression was gen simple, but this is gen multi. Okay. And we are correcting the confidence interval to do decimal place. So once you run that, which I've done here, you look down here, you see that each variable will have a lower bound confidence interval. Okay, each variable will have a lower bound confidence interval here, and then it will have an upper bound confidence interval. So the confidence interval have been generated with this. But honestly, wouldn't it be nice that you have a data and then the confidence interval is also part of the result instead of coming to pull it out separately like this? We'll come back to that. But before that, there is something you want to know it is one of the things used to determine the accuracy of a regression. If I, you're going to learn that we use something called the R square, the adjusted R square, and the root mean square. I want you to note about this is root mean square. We'll come back to that at a proper time. Okay, this root mean square is also used to determine the accuracy of the regression. Okay. And it is based on the square of the residuals. It's based on the mean square of the residual. So that's why it's mean squared error. When you run it, it is 3.17. We'll come and talk about the meaning, but just know how to run it in R, okay? After you've done this, like I said, we'll do all the interpretation at a later time. We we'll just want to run some analysis. And there are some other beautiful analysis you can run. One of them is residual analysis. You remember I told you the other time you can run ANOVA under the simple regression? If you run this under the multiple regression, this is what you get. Okay, you get some beautiful Andover table. Okay. It will not make that much sense, okay, because like I said, the regression is building on the Andover. But you can run the fitted. Remember, the, even though we've added more independent variable, the fitted was the predicted, the kill cap. And we had the kill, which is the actual, okay. And now we are in a multiple regression. So watch this, watch this. We have the actual minus the predicted. And we said that that was equal to the residual. Do you remember? The error, the residual. Okay. We know the actual, but we can find the predicted using this command, okay? Using this fitted command, 98. Command number 90. Once you run that, you will see that now the gap has lowered. Do you realize that? If you look at even the first observation, it was 160. Under the simple regression, it moved to 162. But under this multiple regression, it's just 161. So it appears that as you are adding more independent variable, you are reducing the errors. You are cutting down the errors because the errors was negative 2.16. Let's see the error now. Let's run command number 99. That command number 99 is the residual of the gene multi, the multiple regression. That residual I'm about to generate is the unexplained part of the regression. If you run that, look at that. Look at that. The gap is 1.7. Okay. So it shows that the error, which was negative 2.16, has come down to negative 1.7. So the gap has come down because you are adding more independent variables. But that does not mean that because of that, you should just be adding any unpleasant, irrelevant, independent variables. Because when you do that, you could be punished by the adjusted R squared. And we'll look at that later. Okay. So just know that the adjusted R squared penalizes you for including irrelevant variables in the regression. Another thing you can find is the expected value of the error term. You remember we found it to be zero under the simple regression. If I run that carefully, you will notice that it is even more zero than the previous one. It's also zero. If you look at it, okay, it is it is e minus 17, which means there are 17 zeros. 
The other one, I think there were 16 zeros or so. So this one is more zero than the previous one. Again, it shows that the expected value of the error term assumption has been achieved. So these are all beautiful things you can do. Okay. Then you can also plot the residuals. You can plot the residuals versus the fitted. Let me share something with you before we move on regarding this residual versus the fitted. You see, in any regression that you generate, in any regression that you do, there are certain things that you want to take note. And I want to take you back here to appreciate this. The residual versus the fitted, which we're about to show right now, you can use it when we come to diagnostics, regression diagnostics. What do I mean by that? Okay, what I mean is that regression diagnosis is when you are checking whether the assumptions of the classical linear regression models have been met. Whether the assumptions have been met. Now, one of the assumptions says that there should be a linear relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. The relationship should be linear. This graph, the fitted versus the residual, can help you detect that. Another assumption says that there should be almost elasticity of the errors. The fitted versus the residual graph can guide you. And also, we do not want outliers in the data set. The fitted versus the residual plot can help you also detect outliers. So ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to run the fitted versus the residual plot to see what is happening. Okay, remember, we'll look at this deeply later on. So if you run this okay, on the command number 101 here, okay, you see the fitted versus the residual plot right here. Down, the, the fitted versus the residual plot, you will notice something here. The red line is showing, actually the fitted line is the dotted that you see in the middle. I don't know if you see it well, but it is there. It is there. Let me make it slightly bigger. Okay, so that's it. Okay. So that dotted line, that da -da 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 line, and you can see this dotted line just straight fitted. Okay. This is residual. That dotted line, is the fitted line. And you want the, the, the goal is that the residual line must move in a similar fashion. Okay. And you can see the residual line is a red line, not the one I drew, but this red line. So the red line, if you look at what the red line is doing, the red line is a little bit deviational from the fitted line. So it appears that that there appears to be not much of what? Linearity, but we'll check it with other things. The other thing is that it appears that there is not much of homoscedasticity because there must be a constant you know, variance okay, showing between the fitted and the, the, the Right now, it's not that clear whether there's a variance, but it appears to have detected some outliers at the top there. Okay, observation 24 or so is showing an outline. So what this does is that it gives you a picturesque understanding of what you might face when you're doing um, diagnostic testing. There's another graph that will put all of them plus other things okay, together. When you run this part info command in 102, this part info command we we'll put the next graph I'm about to draw in four spaces, four quadrants. Okay. It's the same fitted versus residual. That's what I've generated here. It's the same fitted versus residual, which is the first one. There are other ones like normal quantile probability plot, and then the scale location plot and the residual versus leverage plot. All of these are very good plots. We'll talk about them later. They are good for detecting outliers for detecting influential variables. And there's a difference between an outlier and an influencer. So those are some of the things that you do. Okay. But when we come to diagnosis, you'll get it. Now let's go to how to generate the regression in such a way that 
you can get the confidence interval straight away. And also add that kind of regression you can include. So don't forget our original regression. Our original regression we had was called Gen Multi. Gen Multi. Let me just remind you of that by right, running this command 108. But before you can run the command we're about to show, you want to demonstrate, you want to install a package called J-Tools. You see, J-Tools is a wonderful package, lovely package. And what it does, what it does is that it allows you to generate beautiful regression, wonderful regressions, which you can export straight away to your thesis, to your paper. Let's run the library J-Tools. Once you run that, I'm going to now run this gen multi command again, but I'm going to let J-Tools show the results. Now watch how it's true. But for it to show the results, I don't type summary, I type sum. And you can command this using this J2 command to indicate that the confidence interval is true, which means I want you to also show the confidence interval. Okay. And then the p-values is true. And I want you to all convert them to two decimal places. When it does that, it will not give you the standard errors. So watch it down here. There you go. There, there, there you go. You see the beautiful thing that is happening here. Okay. This is it. Now let me go to the top first. Okay, let me go to the top. You see, it tells you what kind of regression model you are dealing with. It tells you that observations are 40. It actually tells you which one is a dependent variable. It tells you the type of regression, ordinary least squares regression. It tells you the fitness of the model, the reliability of the model, the factors. And there are three main factors. Okay? The S statistic and its p-value, the adjusted R square and the R square. All of them, it tells you. Okay. And then it tells you that it's using standard errors. Okay. And so on the basis of that, you are able to get each estimate. That's what you see in the first column. So in the first column, you are able to get what? Each estimate. And that's what you get there. Then it will give you the confidence interval straight away, unlike the other one, when, where, which was not giving you the confidence interval. It also gives you the T value and also gives you the P value. So this, this one is quite nice. Again, any one that you feel like using, you want to use. But I'm about to show you something even more incredible. Okay, so follow me here. Now, the, the thing is that you can also run other regression. For example, the regression that we run, we show the intercept. Look at the intercept. We show the value of the intercept. So the intercept was shown, but the intercept is for cosmetic purposes. It's not that much useful. It has no meaningful economic interpretation except during prediction. So it's useful during prediction, but it has shown it. So you can suppress the intercept. By writing this command, I want to just call the command gen multi inter, a gen more under inter underscore inter. Okay, so I run the linear model, and instead of bringing the p first, I rather bring zero first plus the p. What is that? Once you indicate zero plus the first independent variable, it omits, it zeros the intercept. So I'm going to run that. Watch it. Watch it. There you go. I've run that. You didn't see. It's there. Now, where is the intercept now? It's gone. You can see that the first independent variable is a price. And when you go to the previous one, watch the intercept. You see the intercept is shown here. Okay. But in this one, it has removed the intercept. The first independent variable is not intercept, but it's price. So that command actually uses. So that's a model we have run. We have run first the gene multi model. We've also estimated the gene multi without the interface. So keep it in mind. We have two models we have run. Later on, later on, under the heteroscedasticity, okay, we will indicate some other models. One of them is called robust regression. Now, the robust regression, it corrects the standard errors. 
See, the whole essence of regression is to get a better model. That's the whole thing. You want a better model. So sometimes you kind of, you know, experiment with some models to see which one is the best. And we'll look at what we mean by what is the best, okay? And one of the models you can deal with is a robust regression, the regression that corrects the standard errors. Okay. So it corrects the standard errors. And the way it corrects this is using something we call heteroscedastic autocorrelated consistent standard error. Now this one, it corrects only the heteroscedasticity. The heteroscedasticity simply means unequal variance. There are multiple types of robust standard errors, several of them that you can use. You have HCO, you have HC1, HC2, all the way up to HC5. But the one we are using as the default here, um, there's a default one. Is the default we are using here is HC1. Okay. Um, which is a starter default. If you want to use an R default, you can just make it HC3. Okay. HC3 is R default. The HC1 is the starter. Starter is another software for running several statistical analysis and regressions. Okay. So once we are going to run that, and that will be our third model that we would have run. Now, let's run that. And once you run that, okay, you can, you can show the results. How can you show the results? Let me clean the board here. Okay. One way you can show the results is this. You can just go and highlight what you run at 111 and just run it. Okay. And that is showing the result. Now you will notice that you won't see it clearly, but you will notice that some of the p values may change. For example, look at price. The p value for price was 0 0.06 under the robust regression. But when you go to the original one, the p value was what? Price was 0 0.05. Okay. So some of the items may change. But when you look at um, income, the income, the p-value is 0.14 and location urban is 0 0.09 under the robust. But before, okay, it was all 0, 0, but the income was 0 0.20. So some of them will change. You tend to use which model that you, you justifiably want to use. So that's a third model, keep it in mind. The final model I want to run here, and the reason why I'm running these models is I want you to see different models and how we show all of them at a go. You tend to see these things in papers. The papers will be talking about model one, model two, model three. That's what I want to show you here. The last model I want to show is GLM. So I call the whole thing Gene Multi GLM. GLM stands for Generalized Linear Model. Okay. And it has, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a model that you know, if there is time, we'll look at it later. It's the same thing, but it's just a matter of indicating that with a command GLM instead of LM. LM is linear model. GLM is generalized linear model. Once you run that and show the results, you get this. And you see under that, P is also, the P value for price is 0 0.05. So we have this, I'm not going to interpret all of these models yet. So like I said, there'll be another section I'll use to interpret every number that you see in the model. But for now, I want you to know that you can put all of these models together in a beautiful table. That table can be generated using something we call a package called Hux table, Hux table. In the Hux table, okay, if you install in library it, it will allow you to put everything together. What am I going to put together? This is a command. The command says export underscore sums. The first model I'm going to put together is a gen multi. The second is the one without the intercept. So it's gen new intercept. And then you have the gen multi robust, the one that was trying to correct the standard errors. Then the final one, I also showed gen multi GLM. The one that I said is a generalized linear model. So I'm putting all of this together in one table. Let's watch that. Okay, so now you can, let me make it bigger and you can see the beautiful thing that is happening here. Okay, the table is so big that I need to probably even 
squeeze it a little bit. So let me hopefully zoom out a bit and then you can see the nice results that is showing here. Okay. So watch, you have the model one. The model one is the OLS regression. And you have the every variable and then there's some another variable in the parenthesis. Okay. And the variable in the parenthesis become the standard errors. So you have the coefficients and then the standard errors. And there's a star for those that are significant up to a certain level. We'll talk about all that. The second model is also here. The third is there and the fourth is there. Remember the fourth was the GLM model. The third one was a robust regression model. And this is the one without the intercept. And you can see that the intercept is empty here. Okay. If you look at it, the intercept is empty because that was the one without the intercept. All of them are here. Now, watch something. You will notice that each one has got the sample size to be 40. The R square is showing for some of them. Because some of the models like GLM doesn't give an R square. And some of them are showing the archaic criteria information, information criteria. Some of them are showing the BIC information criteria. All of these are, are you know, statistics for determining the accuracy of the particular kind of regression that you're doing. Some of them are showing the pseudo regression as well. All the continuous predictors are need centered and scaled to one. That's what it says there. And of course, you have the p values for each of the models. Okay, that was done by running the half table. But you can also show another one. You can show another one by also running a stargazer. Yes, you got to know these things, man. You got to know them. You are you are an upcoming professor. You got to know all of these. So the stargazer is another way of showing the results in a table. Now you have your model one, which is multi, gen multi with the one without the intercept. And then I did not bring the robust one. I brought the gen multi gen LM. Okay. And I have them here. But I, in this next command, you have to give them their names. So I call the first one OLS. The second one I indicated is OLS with no intercept. Okay. So I can just call it OLS NT, just NT to indicate NI to indicate no intercept. And then the last one, I just called it JLM. Okay, and I've indicated what type of things I want to show. I want to show something, if it has the sample size, I want it to show. If it has the R square, I want it to show. If it has an F statistic, I want it to get it. If it has a log likelihood ratio, I want to show. If it has the archaic criteria information, I want to see the BIC, I want to see the log likelihood ratio, I want to see the world test, I want to see. So let's run that and see how this also shows the results. There you go, beautiful. Okay. So let's maximize it. And then you can see clearly that we have something happen. So you see this one, it tells you the top yeah, the independent variable, and it tells you which one is the dependent variable, and the dependent variable is Q. You have the OLS, you have the one without an intercept, okay. and then you have the, the normal generalized least square model. And it, the least square model also omits some things. Okay. Um, the OLS and the least square, they omit some things. Some of them will bring some variables, some of them will not bring some variables. You can see that the intercept is at the bottom. They call it the constant in this one. And the model without the intercept didn't have a constant because that's how it was. Okay. And then when you go down, you have the total number of observations. You have the R square. You have the log likelihood ratio. That will come only under the GLM. The others don't need the log likelihood. The attack information criteria is also for the GLM. And then the F statistic is shown for. Oh, beautiful. I don't know whether you see this, but this is, you can just take this thing, export it straight away to your web document, and then you can talk around them. What we are going to do next time is that we are going to now study these tables, detail, look at each variable, and try to understand every little variable and what they mean in this. 
Okay, so that brings us to the end of the entire capital. Please, if you like this video, if you like this information, share it. Okay? Share it with friends and families, co-workers, and even enemies. Tell them that this is a good thing that you have you are, you are enjoying. Share it with your students, share it with your colleagues, okay? Because it will help me to know that I'm also giving value. And if you have a question, always don't forget, okay? So that I you can ask me as, as any question as you can. It will help me to be able to, you know, give you my comments. So please type your questions in there and I'll be very glad to answer all of them. I will see you in the next video, next lecture, where we now look at interpretations of the result. In fact, those are what you normally use in your thesis, your dissertations, and your journal articles, where you now make sense of the tableau okay, and for people to really enjoy. And also how to even bring an executive summary report to what you are learning. There must be an executive summary report to whatever that you are learning there. We'll talk about all this in our next meeting. Until then, drink deep or taste not the appearance. Adios.